This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to The Twilight Show. I'm Graham, and my special guest today is Larry Ferlato, who teaches English, social studies, international baccalaureate classes in a school in Sacramento, California. Apart from teaching Larry Horses a podcast, writes a weekly column about education, and has written a large number of books on education, I've been following Larry's work for years now, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to him. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out, with Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome to The Twilight Show, everyone. I'm Graham Stanley, speaking to you live from Mexico City. On today's show, I'll be talking, as I said in the introduction to Larry Ferlazzo, about his adventures in English language teaching. Apart from being a high school teacher of English, social studies, and international baccalaureate classes to English language learners and mainstream students at Luther Burbank School in Sacramento, California, where he's been teaching for 20 years, Larry has written or co-written over 12 books, hosts a weekly radio show, and writes a very popular education blog, among many other things. Now, I've been an admirer of Larry's work in English language teaching for a good number of years now, particularly through his sharing of websites of the day, which has always been a fascinating source of educational news and resources for teaching since it started. And you can find out more about Larry uh, from his blog, larryfalazzo.edublogs.org, which has been running since 2007. And I will be speaking to Larry right after the Teachers Talk Radio News. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. ASCOL is due to ballot members for the first time in its history. The four education unions will ballot over strike action this term and, if backed by members, would see action stretching into next year and could lead to full school closures. The government continues to hold its position that the most recent pay offer is fair and reasonable and that next year school funding will be at its highest level in history. Schools Week covers the further implications of school funding issues in a story about the cuts some head teachers are making. In a survey conducted by the National Foundation for Education Research for the Sutton Trust, it was found that schools are cutting back on school trips, teaching assistants and IT equipment to help balance stretch budgets. Responses from 1,428 primary and secondary teachers sure 50% of senior leaders said their school had cut back on trips and outings this year. Schools in the most disadvantaged areas were most likely to be impacted by cuts to trips. The research suggests that in secondary schools, leaders are also cutting back on subject choices at both GCSE and A-level. The Department for Education has estimated schools overall could afford £2.4 billion in new spending between 2022 and 2024 before facing net pressure on their budgets. But the Confederation of School Trusts warned its members could face a prolonged period of financial challenge due to pay rises and other increasing costs if more funding was not forthcoming. The Sutton Trusts poll also showed that some school leaders are using pupil premium funding to plug budget gaps. The report also underlines the issue of recruitment into the sector, with the NFER predicting that the DfE will again miss its recruitment into initial teacher training target this year. Meanwhile, the TES focused on a DfE funding rule change to help schools hit by falling pupil numbers due to a decline in birth rate. Schools that are not rated good or outstanding will be eligible for additional funding. Other changes will be introduced from 2024 to 25, and councils will set expectations around the minimum funding they must provide to support schools with significant increases in pupil numbers. Schools with more than one site will also receive extra funding where they need to duplicate services over multiple sites. 
Falling birth rates mean there are projected to be half a million fewer pupils in English state nurseries and primaries in 2028, compared with 2022. Nurseryworld.co.uk reports on the findings of its recent survey into staff wellbeing around Ofsted inspections. In the article on its website, it reports that over 3,000 owners, managers and staff responded to questions around mental health and well-being and the impact of inspections. Many responded that they felt increased stress and anxiety in the run-up to an inspection, with many having sleepless nights and some suffering from panic attacks and depression. The possibility of losing funding, should a setting be judged inadequate, was also mentioned. Full details of the survey can be found on the Nursery World website. The Guardian reports that a record figure of £4.8 billion interest has been added to student debt in Britain last year. The government has more than doubled the amount of money it makes from charging interest on student loans as graduates face borrowing costs of almost twice the rate set by the Bank of England. The Office for National Statistics said the accrued interest had doubled from £2.3 billion in the previous year. The forecast average debt among the cohort of students who started their course in 2021 and 22 is £45,800 when they complete their course. Finally, the Morning Star in Scotland reports that increased spending per school pupil is failing to deliver improved outcomes. Spending per pupil has risen to £8,500 in Scotland, compared with around £7,200 across England, Wales and Northern Ireland but attainment in Scotland is not on a similarly rising trajectory. Research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that despite having the highest spending per pupil across the UK for a long period, test scores in reading, maths and science have either stayed the same or have been going down. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello. This week, I'm going to attempt to explain in simple terms how the internet works. Let's take this tech briefing, for example. I know every single one of you at some point have thought, how on earth can someone who makes a recording in one part of the world be broadcast globally to thousands of people and there'll be very few errors? I won't even go off when you go under a bridge. Although... I did give Tom Rogers a lift once and can tell you he's so radio he stopped talking when I drove through the Mersey Tunnel. For the internet to work, a way of allowing people to simultaneously use the same cables had to be created. The traditional phone call method could not be used because this would limit the number of users. If computers made a dedicated connection like a phone call does, then there'd be a lot of waiting going on. Imagine if you had to wait in line for a download. You are 457th in the queue. Your download is important to us. Please listen to this monotonous music while you wait. It simply would catch on. So what happens? Data is transmitted in a similar way to the postal system, just a lot quicker. Right now, this podcast is arriving on your device in a series of packets. Packets are really small chunks of data that can be sent from device to device via routers. Without getting too geeky on you, the host server gets a request from you when you press play. The request says, start sending me the packets of the audio chocolate you know as Steve Woods' tech briefing. And like chocolate, it's split into chunks. These chunks are given an address to get to, an address of where they came from, some other information like the type of file being sent so your device knows which applications you open it in and a number so the packets can be ordered and rebuilt when they arrive. These packets are directed over the internet by routers that use the address information to direct them and then rebuilt by your device once they arrive. Because packets are so small and can be forwarded rapidly, lots of computers can send data at the same time and keep everybody connected. So next time you're using the internet, consider that what you're looking at has probably been split into thousands of packets routed across the world and been rebuilt in a matter of milliseconds for you to enjoy. As always, if you have a tech question, why not send it to at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods. And that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone. And welcome especially to my guest today, Larry Falato, who I hope is now in the studio with me. Hello, Larry. Can you hear Uh, me? How are you? Yes, I can. Thank you for the invitation, Graham. Fantastic. It's so good to be able to speak to you after so many years of uh, being in touch, in contact uh, and reading all of your uh, suggestions, etc. online. So I'm really happy that you agreed to do this. Well, I appreciate the invitation. I have learned a lot from you over the years, especially relating to uh, computer games and teaching uh, English language learners. 
Fantastic. So, Larry, I think uh, what I'd like to do before we get on to talking about your many and varied activities, um, I'd love to know uh, a little bit about what a typical day is or a typical week is for you these days. Well, I have been teaching uh, in a high school class, a high school room in, in Sacramento, California, uh, for the past 21 years. And though my classes vary from year to year, I generally teach students who are new immigrants to the United States in the morning and then teach our international baccalaureate classes in the afternoon, which also often include um, um, new immigrants to the U.S. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, our class begins uh, officially at 8.30 in the morning, though we have a, an optional class an hour prior to school beginning where new uh, immigrants can come to get extra support. Mm -hmm. And this year, in my first period, I teach... United States history to uh, students who are learning English, followed by a period of English to brand new students to the U.S. And that's a mixture of students from Afghanistan, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, Vietnam, um, Pakistan, uh, it's sort of a mix. I mean, every year it's a mix depending upon really what's happening around the world and yeah. what's causing people to leave, whether it's their, you know, their home countries, whether it's gang violence, economic hardship, uh, the trauma of war, drought, civil unrest. Um, and then in the afternoons, I generally teach a, an IB class called Theory of Knowledge um, and do that for typically about three, three periods. Um, so that's typically what I do. And, and it, it varies. The classes vary year to year depending upon the needs of our school. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have about 1,600 students in our school, a mix of about maybe 30%. Uh, Latino, 30% African American, 30% Southeast Asian. We have a lot of Hmong students whose families came as refugees from the Vietnam War. Right. So that's a short and sweet summary of, of my day. It's varied, seldom dull, always goes by quickly. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's a very different experience, I think, from you know, many teachers of English in other countries who um, who teach students. I mean, I mean, it's really interesting. I often, often think about that when I talk to people who mm -hmm. teach English in other countries for, you know, the challenge that they have or that in you and, 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 and your colleagues have is having students come for short periods of time to learn English where the rest of their lives are generally spent speaking their home language, right? Yeah. In, right in the United States, we're in a situation, or in England and, and other English-speaking countries, where students are coming to, you know, learn English, which is the dominant language in the new country that they are generally hoping to spend the rest of their lives. So um, we may have fewer motivation challenges, but we have, I think, one of the, the challenges that teachers of English in the U.S. face are that our, our, the challenges that our students face is that they had very little choice in deciding to come to a new country and uprooting, you know, leaving their homes. Mm -hmm. They're very, you know, they have to deal with the trauma uh, that many experienced getting here. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, I think, a generally a slightly different set of challenges to, um, uh, that the, that the teachers in, of English in English speaking countries face to those and, and others. Yeah. 
Definitely. Thanks, Larry. That's really interesting. I think also I would imagine there's quite a large element of culture involved in the teaching of, of, of English in your context. Would that be right? Yes. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the, you know, for many, for, for example, for many of the students who come to the United States, uh, their home countries, women, you know, women are perceived differently than mm. women here in the United States, that, um, uh, that their respect for, for women and, I mean, you know, having young men and women in the same class, for example, or right. the, um, on, on how people view genders, um, gender preferences is very mm -hmm. different. So, it, you know, I mean, people that can be, a, that's definitely a challenge <laughs> and it can, and it can be a challenge. Of uh, course. But, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, especially in our school where we have such a, a mixture of, um, of race and race and ethnicities, mm -hmm. you know, there, you know, there, there are sometimes tensions there, but, uh, you know, we work through it, but we face it head on and not try to sort of push it under the rug on all, on all of those issues. And at of the course. same time, it's a great learning experience for me and our other students to learn about the home cultures of our students. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, um, I mean, it's really interesting. One, one story I, mm -hmm. I tell really when I was teaching, uh, U S history uh, a number of years ago that, um, in, in California where I teach, there's a, a long history of, um, Spanish missionaries you know, hundreds of years ago, creating missions throughout the state and enslaving Native mm -hmm. Americans. And it was interesting, you know, one of the questions that I raised to students, I said, well, you know, what, what would you do if you were in that situation? What do you think you would do if you were a Native American enslaved? Would you fight back? Would you, you know, run? You know, what would you do? And it was very interesting. And, you know, a lot of the students said, oh, we would really fight back. But then I had a number of students there who were Hmong immigrants who had mm -hmm. the experience of they and their families fought back. And many of them were murdered as a result mm -hmm. of that before escaping through the jungle. So it was very interesting to then to hear, you know, and they ran you know, after that. And it was very interesting for our students who were answering that question on a purely theoretical level yeah. to hear from other students who experienced the, you know, had a very similar experience directly to say, no, this fighting back business, you know, is, you know, it may sound glorious, but you're going to end up dead. You know, running right. away is a better option. I mean, it was a very, you know, and it was a very interesting dynamic. And those are some of the, great opportunities we have for people to learn for students to learn from each other and for we teachers to learn from our students. Uh, of course, it sounds like uh, it could end up being quite a fascinating uh, discussion with mm -hmm. your students. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to know about the, the level of English as well. I would imagine it's very, it's varied uh, and that can be a challenge or do you end up trying to stream them per, uh, per level? Um, is that possible? It is uh, in our school because we have larger numbers. We're mm. able to to level the, the classes um, more. So, for example, my newcomers class is is comprised almost exclusively of students who have been in the United States for a year or less. Main, mm -hmm. mo, mo, mainly less. I mean, could be like a day, right? And you know, to right. a to a year. Um, 
whereas my U.S. history class is more intermediate of students who have been in this country for, you know, for two to three years. And we have, since we have larger numbers of immigrant students, we have another English class for intermediate English language learners, and then another class uh, for students who are, who are higher, higher proficiency in English. So, uh, so some years I do have done a, both a newcomer and intermediate combined, which can be a bit, you know, can be a bit challenging, but, uh, um, but we get through it and, you know, basically through all the mistakes I've made over the years, I'm able to, to, to manage it. Uh, I think the bigger challenge for us is sometimes, depending upon what's happening in the world, uh, the numbers of our classes can get pretty big right? during the midday. I mean, you know, with enough planning, we're usually able to maneuver it, but you can't plan for an American immediate withdrawal from Afghanistan or a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'm sure that's a challenge throughout the world. Mm -hmm. When you deal, you know, when teachers have to respond and schools have to respond to those crises and a huge influx of refugees. Um, so the, on, uh, the, go ahead. On average, Larry, wh what are the class sizes that you, you end up teaching? Uh, well, this, e this year, since we've added some levels, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I, I mean, I, for my newcomers, generally 25 to 30 students. Mm -hmm. And for um, the intermediate class, about, for U.S. history, maybe 35. Uh, right. One of the other things that we do is we have peer tutors. Mm -hmm. that, so on top of those numbers, we have students who are uh, seniors who are either former students of mine in the IB program or... Mm -hmm former newcomers who have increased their proficiency in English and they get credit for helping in the class. So I, for example, this year I have 10 peer tutors in my newcomers class. So I'm able to teach a lesson and then have groups of two to three students work with one peer tutor for like 15 minutes to reinforce that lesson. Um, so that helps a lot, I think. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's one of the, one of the benefits we have to having a teaching in a large high school and having administrators who are committed to supporting, uh, new immigrants. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine that that's, that makes it, uh, it, it helps a lot to have that support, doesn't it? Yeah, yes. And what about the actual teaching, Larry? I think um, I'd love to hear about how your approach to teaching, uh, what your approach to teaching is and how maybe it has changed over the years through this experience of teaching the multilingual classes of different levels. Do you think it has changed quite a lot since you first started? I think so. I mean, I think that... Uh, you know, as I said, I think through many, many mistakes and through uh, learning from students and through some successes, uh, I've changed a fair number of things. I still remember my, the first day I taught, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, we had just, the last, refu last refugee camp in Thailand had closed mm -hmm. and uh, Sacramento was getting huge numbers of Hmong refugees who had never been to school before. And right. Hmong language didn't exist in writing until relatively recently. So they were sort of pre-literate and never been in school before. And so I got a, the first day of school, I had, you know, 30 students who were maybe 17 years old. None had any literacy and none had been in school before. And, wow. uh, um, I mean, it, it ended up being a, just an extraordinary experience, but I still remember after the first period of class, I went to my colleague and said, Oh my God, I've got to figure out people need to 
how do I teach someone how to hold a pencil? You know, I, you know, I mean, it was, I was prepared for a lot of things, but I wasn't prepared for that. I mean, but I mean, these, they were brilliant students, right. And, and they've all gone into, had wildly successful lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's, every year to a certain extent it changes because uh, in addition to the fact that students speak different home languages and they come from different experiences and the trauma they have, they also have varies, varying degrees of prior schooling and some mm -hmm. not having any schooling at all. So I think that's, you know, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a big issue in terms of trying to differentiate. But I think I try to, I think the strategy that I try to take is recognizing that English language learners, students are as smart and in many ways smarter than many other students at our school. Mm -hmm. They just don't know English yet. Yeah. So having to teach English in a way that acknowledges their that brilliance and that sophistication, whether it is um, using inductive learning, whereas you know having a picture, teaching words, having students on their own categorize those words, whether they are around food or whether they all start with R. And then having them, you know, add to those categories and then have to write sentences and put those sentences into categories. So, I mean, using those kinds of higher level Bloom's, ta you know, higher level and Bloom's ta taxonomy to, to teach English uh, in a way that's accessible, but also uses those um higher order ways of thinking and then um you know at the same time looking at how to promote and how to create the condition i think one of the ways that i have i think particularly changed over the years is you know prior to becoming a teacher i was a, a community organizer for 19 years working in immigrant mm -hmm. communities to help people develop political power to to make changes and this issue of intrinsic motivation has always been something that has been important to me and trying to create the conditions in my classroom where students want to learn has yeah. been really important and i have placed a very high priority on that and not using you know using fewer carrots and sticks and more helping students, you know, help you know, identify their goals, try to figure out how what I'm teaching, help them, you know, reach those goals, how to help you know, create conditions where they develop relationships, where they, yeah. you know, want to be in the classroom. You know, th those are some areas I think I've, you know, evolved over the years. And of course, you know, technology has also evolved over the past 20 years. Of, of course. And, and that's how we first connected, I think. I mean, with your blog that you started, I believe, to share um, websites, I imagine that the impulse for that was to, you were finding resources to help your students. And that is probably what gave you the idea to start the the blog, which is how I first came across your work. Is, is that the case or did it happen in another way? No, that's exactly the case. Trying to figure out how, you know, um, again, dealing with adolescent English language learners, especially back mm -hmm. then, there were, you know, the, you know, the books that were there around that, that was accessible to them were basically books geared towards uh, toddlers. Right. You know, which is not a very engaging book for adolescents. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I was, and, and back then, finally, there were uh, online uh, books that provided 
audio and vi and visual support uh, for higher interest topics. And mm -hmm. I think that's what got me first interested in trying to explore technology. And then I began the blog to share and also to ensure that I wouldn't lose track of them. So, uh, uh, I mean, and then, you know, after, after a while, um, sorry, after a while okay. I began to, um, get more involved also in, uh, dealing with broader education issues and participating in our union, uh, and began to use the blog and uh, to write more about education policy issues, as well as providing resources to support my students and to support teachers who taught students like my, like, you know, like mine. And, and up until, I mean, in addition to teaching English language learners over the years, for many years, I also taught students who were English proficient, but mm -hmm. were dealing with literacy issues and had other challenges. So over my over the course of my teaching career, I've taught a wide range of students for a wide range of subjects, and the blog was a good resource to accumulate uh, places that would supplement my instructional teaching. Of course, I imagine you never thought when you started the blog that you would be, that it would still be going this many years later, or, or did you have that in mind that it was something that you thought you would be doing for quite a long time? No, no clue. No, <laughs> no, you know, who? it has been going on for quite a while. So, um, and, but it's and how... continued to, to be useful to me and to others. Of course, it definitely has been. Even though blogs you... are, uh, even though blogs blogs are a little passe, but they seem to be coming back, maybe a little bit now. So yeah, yeah. I um I think there's a lot more uh, to blogs. I think with social media, people turned away from them just because it seemed to be more immediate to post things on social media. But one of the things I think people are starting to realize is that social media is very ephemeral so it's very difficult to find anything that you post on facebook for example or on twitter oh yeah, um, yeah if you if you need to whereas a blog you have that archive and it is actually very easy to to go back and find things which makes it very valuable doesn't it yes i think that's true i mean there are so many great twitter threads and then they're gone. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you need you need to capture them and link them on blogs to in order to uh, right for them yeah. to have value in the uh, later on, doesn't it? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I'd love to know about how when you first started the blog and started people started uh, teachers started getting to know more about it. How how did it kind of take off? Because it seemed very very quickly that you were one of the prominent voices, I think, in educational blogging through what you were doing. How did you think that sort of came about? Was it just because you were posting so frequently or were there other things that you did that you think helped your blog get a lot of attention from teachers? Well, I think posting regularly has definitely one of the reasons. And I think also it's just very practical. I think that's mm -hmm. why... Uh, in, in terms of the responses, the feedback that I get from the books that I write and the books that I co-author is that the books are, you know, the stuff we produce is practical mm -hmm. and it needs to be, I mean, it's the main focus is how it's going to help me actually. I mean, I, I think yeah. everything I write is really geared towards, how it's going to help me, <laughs> you know, it, it really, really does the teaching because, you know, writing, as you know, helps you think through things, Of course, you know, it's, uh, and, you know, the challenges that I face in the classroom are very similar to the challenges that teachers face everywhere. So it's, I mean, you know, I mean, there are some, you know, some differences, but, you know, for if you're teaching English 
to students who don't know English, you know, a lot of the strategies that work for me will work for anybody else. If we're trying to help students become more intrinsically motivated, same, you know, the same thing. And of course, um, so Larry, yeah. speaking about the, the books I've written, um, I imagine that the moving towards writing books came from an extension to the blog. Um, were you approached to write a book or did you decide to approach a publisher or how, how did it work and uh, sure. how did you start? Yeah, initially I was, uh, for, our, for my first book, I was approached mm -hmm. by a publisher um, uh, to write a book about parent engagement. Uh, and how to connect parents to a more active participation with, uh, you know, student life in schools. And then after that, uh, I sort of just, you know, came up with some ideas mm -hmm. of, of, of books. And that did the, would, did the ahead. publisher, um, approach you because of the blog or was it for, Yes, Something I think else? so. Yeah, I think because yeah. of the blog and other articles that I had been there. I mean, I think these days, I mean, back then, I think even more so these days, publishers, if they see somebody who has had a a fair amount of writing experience, they know that they can, yeah. you know, write one sentence after another, you know, you know, you know, in a fairly accessible, accessible form. So, or, yeah. And then, and then the other thing they're interested in is people who have some presence in social media, uh, you know, of online. Course. So, um, but it's been good. I mean, and writing the books again, I think the writing the books has been very helpful to me and my co-authors to just sort of keep track of what we do in the classroom. I mean, I, I mean, I consult the books all the time, you know, I mean, we got, you know, and, and like all the student handouts and all the books are also are always freely available on the publisher's website, no registration required. We made, you know, that was one, that's one of the requirements, anything I, I write. And, you know, if I have a student teacher in the classroom, I can, you know, give them the book and say, go to this chapter to get prepped. I mean, it's, it's all, I mean, I want to support teachers everywhere and mm -hmm. I want to support students everywhere. But in terms of my time, I want to do something that anything I do, I want to benefit me and my students. It's so, uh, uh, it's, it's very, you know, it's just helpful to have all that stuff in books so I can just look it up and sure, uh, either in the hard copy form or, yeah. you know, search the, search the online piece and it's right there. I don't have to, of course. don't have to search around in, you know, in Google Drive, which is this, you know, this maze that I still haven't quite <laughs> figured out how to organize it. So, I, but it's, and I, I have a much better handle on when it's stuff is in the books. Of course. Yeah, I can imagine. So to go back to that first book, Larry, the building parent engagement in schools, which you co-wrote, I think with, uh, Laurie, Laurie Hammond, Hammond. Uh -huh. um, how do you relate to looking back on that, uh, book and engaging parents to to help with education in schools. Do you think things have changed recently related to that? Well, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm a strong advocate for, of parent engagement. And uh, I still think the challenge that a lot of schools have is, I mean, I think that what I talked about, and it really came from my community organizing background, that I think sort of involvement is more, doing to parents where engagement is doing with in terms right. of you know asking parents um you know their ideas i mean i know for me one of the most effective 
actions I can take is talking to a parent and saying, tell me about the time, the year that your, your child was most engaged in school. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the teachers did to help make that happen? Um, and so I think that there are a lot of things that schools can do to promote this engage, parent engagement. I think here in the United States, unfortunately, what, what, one of the things we're dealing with right now is a right-wing, what's called parent rights effort that is being yeah. pushed by a very, very, very tiny minority of parents you know, to ban books, to challenge cultural responsive teaching, to uh, harass teachers, that it's basically bullying, uh, and that that, you know, un unfortunately, I think this, in, in terms of the media at least, that that parents, the parents' rights movement is is giving parent engagement a bad name <laughs> here in the United States, especially in more conservative areas. Less of an issue here in California, though in some pockets it is. But it's, you know, where some parents feel that they have, the, you know, because they don't want their child to have access to one thing, you know, to a, to a book or or they don't want their child to learn something that means no child can have access to that book and no child can learn something so um yeah i mean i don't, I don't know if there's a you know equivalent of this conservative effort in you know in other countries but that is a a major challenge that's that that we're confronting in the united states and what we have is uh, Republican operatives are capitalizing on that and using that as a political tool, not because they care about the, child, their child, the children in schools, but because they want to elect Republicans in office. Okay, yeah. Now, I think it, it's certainly something that um, is in the news. I think you talked about whether it's happening elsewhere. I think there's been a bit of a polemic in the UK, for example, about an author called Roald Dahl, um, who is the author behind books such as Matilda and Jolly and the Chocolate Factory, right, right. made into very successful films, etc., and theatre plays. And I think a lot of his, the language in his books um, is being looked at, and I think the publisher has just um, produced a, a highly edited version of it, which uh, is at the forefront, I think, of this idea of whether you should go back to books that were written in a different age and uh, and change them to suit the sensibilities of our age. Mm -hmm. And there's no real sort of... I think there's two camps, basically, uh, relate to that but definitely we are seeing a lot more news about things that are happening in the states about banning books mm -hmm. um it seems every week or every couple of weeks oh, yeah. uh, there's some kind of news article about something happening somewhere in the states about that so it's quite interesting what you're saying yeah so but i but but, but there's no question that parent engagement is really important that in my experience at least the uh, closure of our schools during the peak of the COVID epidemic has resulted in greater support of teachers in our yeah. communities because they sort of see what we have, you know, more what we have to do each day. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, more interest I, among our parents, we may not have parents who come to our back to school night. We have a low turnout on that, but that's, you know, because they're working two jobs to support their families. You know, our, 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 our communities where our community, where our school in is, is a, is a very low income community. 
but parents are extremely interested in making helping their students be successful and are very responsive to calls and emails and want to do whatever they can uh, this you can't measure a parent's commitment to their child's education by whether or not they show up on a back to school night right um, no so. of course not that's it's what very interesting what you said about um what happened as a response to the pandemic because it's definitely something that i noticed and have heard colleagues and other teachers talk about the idea with schools around the world closed and parents being forced to take a more active role in educating their children <laughs> there was definitely a greater appreciation for the role of the teacher by parents um, which is, you know, if there's anything, there are a few good things I think may well have come out of the whole school's closure experience, and that is probably one of them. Right. Do you think that is still sort of continuing? Do you see that in, there is an engagement of parents naturally now because the, you know, as a result of the school's closures and their greater appreciation, or has it gone back to, what was happening pre-pandemic? Well, I think it varies. Um, in our in in Sacramento, the city where I teach, we we had to go on strike last spring because right our district, which has terrible leadership, uh, was proposing a reduction in teacher pay, which is ridiculous. Oh really? Uh, wow. So, yeah. So, but we went on a nine-day strike. We got basically everything that we need, we wanted. But as a result, three new school board members. I mean, one of the reasons we won that strike is we had enormous parent support, and we had a group of parents who actually occupied the school district office. Oh, wow, that's... Uh, yeah, for several days. Quite in terms of sleep, yeah, yeah, in terms of actually sleeping there until we got an agreement. And then as a result of uh, of that, the next school, the school board election, which happened several months later, three school board candidates who had been recruited by our teachers union won election. So there's, you know, brand new leadership in our school, you know, in, in our school district primarily as a result of support from parents. So I think oh, it varies, cool. yeah, it varies from place to place, but I think that's a good example of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that we would have been as successful as we had been without the, the additional support that was generated when parents both gained a greater appreciation of of teachers by what they saw as doing online and by what they had to do in our absence. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. It's uh, really interesting to hear that. <coughs> Excuse me. So Larry, going back to some of the other books that you've written or co-written, which I think you, you've written quite a lot of, of them over 12, definitely. Mm -hmm. Which, which do you think you're most, proud of uh, or which of the books that you've written do you think has had the greatest impact on teachers well i think the the ell teachers i think there are three that stand out the ell teachers toolbox is by far the the most popular book that katie hole my colleague and co-author have ha have written uh which lays out you know, 45 key strategies for teaching ELLs. And that's um, sold a lot of copies, uh, you know, over the past few years. And we're now working on a second edition of that. Right. It'll be out in, eight, in 18 months. That I, that I think is one thing that te that's teachers have found very helpful. We recently... Last year, Katie and I came out with a second edition of the ESL ELL Teacher Survival Guide, which I think is also really good. Um, mm -hmm. And 
designed to help teachers who are teaching newcomers and intermediates. Uh, and then the most recent book that just came out last month is called The Student Motivation Handbook, 50 Ways to uh, Boost an Intrinsic Desire to Learn, which I think is very practical and very helpful, uh, both to me and to, you know, to, to, teachers, to teachers anywhere. Um, Mm-hmm. But I think those those three books are, are very practical. Uh, again, all the student handouts are available online at the at the book's website without having to register. Uh, they're all research informed, and they're based on classroom experience, on where they where they work, when they work, and when they fail. In the ELL teachers toolbox. You know, for every every one of those strategies, we have a section said what could go wrong. Right. Because if because if it if it can go wrong, we've it's we've made it go wrong. <laughs> so uh, um, so at least people can hopefully it can, they can make their own new mistakes and not repeat the mistakes that we've made. Uh, yes. So I think that's. Uh, but I think right, you know, right now working on the second edition the, of the EL Teachers Toolbox, it's a lot of work. I mean, there are 40, mm. 45 strategies now. There will be 61 in the next one. There are going to be an infographics for each chapter, making it a little, you know, sort of more at a, at a glance. I think, it, I think teachers will find that uh, particularly useful and I'm not – super enthusiastic about the work that's involved in writing it but um but it's it'll it's useful for me in my own teaching as well so it's a good refresher um and hopefully my students can benefit as well as students from around the world of course yes i'm sure they will um to go back to what you were saying about the book that you are writing uh, have recently written on motivation i think motivation is something you've already touched upon it uh, earlier that particularly interests you i think uh if i look at the list of books that you've written for example is teaching strategies for student motivation helping students motivate themselves building a community of self-motivated learners etc so i think <coughs> your focus when it comes to motivation is definitely focusing on helping the students motivate themselves. Would that be, am I right in thinking that is where your major interest is? Yes, without a doubt. That doesn't mean that I don't use extrinsic motivation in the classroom. doesn't mean I sometimes don't use carrots and sticks, but I think it's a question of what I, I, what side do we tend to go on? So I feel like I tend to go on the, and I strive to move to, to go on the side of helping to create the conditions for intrinsic motivation. In community organizing, we talked about how we live in the world as it is, not as, mm-hmm. not the world that we'd like it to be, but we should always strive towards the world that we'd like it to be. But, uh, and if we, if we just, focus in the world we like it to be will become hopeless sentimentalists. But if right. we focus only on the world as it is, you know, we become, you know, cynical realists. So the, you know, the idea is to just always be aware. I mean, be, be, be practical, but what, again, what is the side you tend to move on? So, uh, so I just want, I mean, I'm not, I'm not some Pollyanna, you know, pie in the sky, person who says oh no you know don't give that student a referral because he's acting out no i mean yeah give the kid a referral to the office but then have a conversation with him or her about why he or she acted that way what he or she could do in the future what that person what he or she needs from me to reduce the odds of that being repeated so um just want to make that clear (laughs) <laughs> of course. So, Larry, if I'm if I were to ask you what you think are the key 
factors to helping students motivate themselves, for example, what would you what would you say? Is it something that you sure. can? Sure. Yeah. Well, actually, there. Yeah, and I think what researchers say that there are four key elements of it, and that's how like my student motivation book is divided into those four key ways and how to to respond to each one of them. You know, one is we all need we all respond to having more autonomy. So in the classroom, do students how how much say do students have in what they're learning and how they're learning it? Right. I mean, can you, can students choose their own groups sometimes? Can right. students, do you give students an option of, you know, three prompts to respond to their writing an essay as opposed to just one? Uh, you know, two competence is you're asking students to do, do they have a pretty good odds of being successful at doing it? Right. I mean, what kind of scaffolds do you provide? Do you provide sentence starters? Uh, do you create situations where they see their own development? You know, for example, we have I have weekly weekly tests and put them on a you know a spreadsheet with a sort of a bar graph so students can see for themselves how they're progressing. They can see that, um, so they have a greater sense of competence. Um, relatedness is what you're asking them to do going to help bring them in relationship, greater relationship with someone they like or they respect. Again, can they choose their own groups? Have, have I as a teacher focused on developing a relationship with a student and getting to know them? You know, I mean, I have like weekly, a weekly one minute Google Forms check-in that students respond to. So I have an idea of what's going on and I can talk with them about it, what's going on with their lives. So is that, Larry, a, um, a kind of one-to-one, -one, a way of you having a one-to-one -one sort of channel to each of the students in your yeah. classes? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it works. And the last question is, is there anything else that Mr. F that would be helpful for Mr. Falazzo to know, right? So I know, oh, my grandfather had a stroke this week. Or you know something like that, and then I think the right. and then the fourth the fourth area that researchers have found is relevance. You know, is what I'm asking students to learn going to help them achieve their goals, or that the relevance also means is something they would enjoy. That's where games come in, right? I mean, it's right. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of I mean, there are a number of things that are not so necessarily relevant to my life or my goals but I enjoy doing it. So that would, you know, that I want to, I, you know, I want to do it. I mean, I, there was the New Yorker had a big article about a history of door-to-door -door salesmen that has nothing to do. And I found that very interesting. It had nothing to do with helping me achieve my goals in life, but I found it interesting. Mm. So, um, so I think the, the challenge for all of us teachers is to figure out fairly simple strategies that fit into those categories that will help. I mean, that's how we can create the conditions where uh, intrinsic motivation will tend to flourish. Right. And what about, i um, sort of intrigued to know more about the other book that you've written, the community, building a community of self-motivated learners. Does that come in, does that come out of having a focus on each of the students as individuals and making sure that they're all self-motivated as individuals? Or there are there other other sort of strategies or things that you can encourage that um, will help build the community of self-motivated learners? Well, I think there are a number of things that 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 we can do and again it relates to that focus on relatedness that that that's important for motivation i know one of the things that i try to do at the beginning of each year is i don't do a a list of i mean i, I basically i don't do a rule creation process with students i tell them the rules are we um we respect each other don't don't touch others other, each other's stuff and just be nice, right? That's basically the, you know, the rules, but yeah, we have a conversation about what does a 
community of learners mean? Uh, what does that look like? as opposed to what does a classroom of students look like? And what are the characteristics of each one? And which, you know, what do we want to, what do we want to create? Uh, I also, we also talk about, you know, learning English is hard. It's, you know, it, you know I mean, it, it doesn't, it's in many ways, it doesn't make any sense, right? And that one teacher for 30 students is not enough to help people learn English, that everybody has to be a teacher. And, you know, we talk about, well, what does that mean? You know, how, how can I help the other students in my class learn? I can be a model by not always looking at my cell phone. I can be a model by coming in, you know, coming to class on time. Okay, or when I'm done with my work early, I can go help somebody else and not just give them the answer. But what is, you know, it means something different for everybody, but I try, not always successful, to help develop a culture of everybody is a teacher. Um, right. And everybody's supporting each other. Right. Does it work all the time? No. Does it work most of the time? Maybe not even most of the time, but it works some of the time. Right, and when, yeah. it, and when it works, it works really well, I suppose. Right, right. I mean, we're dealing with we're dealing with kids, right? I mean, we're dealing with the kids, and we're dealing with and, and a lot of kids who have a lot of trauma, right? And and I yeah. have bad days sometimes too. I mean, I, you know, Friday I was not particularly patient with students, um, but I mean, we're all but you know they'll forget about it. It'll be fine on Monday, and I'll go back to trying my best. I mean, I would not want to. I would not want to have had my class videotaped on Friday. <laughs> it would not have been. Yeah, a... We all have those days, Larry. Yeah. I think. <laughs> so long as they're not every day. Uh, I think right. That's fine. Right. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think um, that is really interesting. I think what what I'd like to know is how you manage to fit everything in, Larry, because it seems like you've got a very full day of teaching, a uh, very full week of teaching. Then you have the blog, which you update, you have a radio show and the books. How do you manage to find all the time to do everything? Um, is it down to very good time management, do you think, or lack of sleep? What is it? <laughs> well, it's good time management. Uh, it's, I'm lucky to teach at a energizing school with supportive administration. I have an extraordinarily supportive spouse. My wife's great. Uh, children, I, the children are out of the house, you know, and grown so that, right. that, you know, so that, that creates some space also. And I enjoy playing basketball and pickleball. So I get some energy through that i don't know if the pickleball craze has hit many other countries but it's i only heard about it very recently i'm still uh, not quite sure what it is but uh, i know it's very popular in the states at the moment is that right yeah it's tennis for old people <laughs> basically <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but a lot of young people but a lot of young people are playing it now too so uh but that in basketball gives me energy so um but it, it got, yeah, I mean, I'm able able to to keep to keep busy. I mean, the book writing is primarily over the summer, so oh, it's okay. pretty hard to to I, I, you know I need sort of sustained a sustained period of time to be able to do that. So, right. uh, but writing in the blog helps. You know, I'm able to do that and able to build on that. A lot of the stuff I write for that for the book. So. Uh, but I mean, a lot of, you know, supportive community and, uh, but I also need to get a life, you know, probably, I mean, I could do a little more reading for pleasure and I have some good friends, but I could probably spend a little more time with them. Well, there's, there's always, 
more things that we can do, I think, uh, or that we'd like to do if we had the time. I think everyone is the same. So um, what about the future? Have you got any um, particular projects in mind or areas where you'd like to explore or develop? Well, for the next for the next year, Katie and I will be working on the uh, second edition of the ELL Teachers Toolbox, and then after that, we're supposed to write a book that's uh, more geared towards all teachers, um, not just teachers of ELLs, um, and then probably uh, another sort of a second 50 ways to boost uh to boost intrinsic desire to learn a second motivation student motivation handbook but after that i i don't know i think at that point i will be retired from teaching if not close or close to it so uh we'll see what happens after that uh so do you have anything in mind that you would like to do when you retire do you think well, you would continue with some of the things you've been doing, like the book writing, et cetera, or, or well, would you think, have a complete change? No, I think I want to stay connected to teaching. I, I mean, I've talked, Katie is a few years younger than me, and I think I'll probably be volunteering in her classroom a couple of days a week uh, to continue my hand in teaching. I, I have taught in uh, university level teacher prep programs, but I don't think I want to return to that. So I don't know. I'll have to, uh, um, I think it'll be important. If I, if I do writing, I will continue to have to, I think my teaching informs my writing. So, uh, I would of course. need to continue to do some kind of, of teaching and probably more pickleball. I don't know about a bit more basketball at that point. I may be a little, uh, getting a little too old for that, but we'll see. I got a few more years, but, uh, right now I, I'm more concerned about getting through this school year. <laughs> so... <laughs> yes. The challenges that, uh, that everyone faces on the day to day, the week to week and, and the particular, yeah. Yeah. We've is, got seven uh... more, we got six or seven more weeks. So I'll be, and, they're renovating our school over the summer, so we have to literally pack up every single thing in our classroom. Oh, this, right. Uh, and they're going to put them in a storage locker. So I'm not looking forward to doing that. Uh, so, but that's my next seven weeks finishing okay. up. <laughs> um, one of the other things I meant to ask you earlier when we were talking about um, <clears throat> your, your, um first sort of steps into teaching is what made you what made you become a teacher larry was it someone in the family or was it something you saw and you also said you you were working with um in i can't remember exactly what you mentioned the community organizing. work yeah community organizing what made you make the change from community organizing to teaching was it something you saw or was it an opportunity well, I, I, what I was experiencing in organizing is that people were learning skills um, about and, and learning what they were capable of doing in organizing around getting affordable housing, getting you know, around immigration, immigrant rights, getting more child care, getting more safety in their communities, that they were developing skills both reading, writing, speaking, listening, and having a dramatically positive impact on their lives. And they were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s while this was happening. I thought, God, wouldn't it be better if people learned these skills even younger? Right. <laughs> and how much better their lives, how, you know, they would, they would feel about their lives. And that's when I began to explore teaching and was able to was lucky enough to find a school that was supportive and trying you know interested in trying to develop that kind of culture where 
students would be would feel like they would have the skills to transform society because as we all know as all the research says that you know that what happens within the four walls of the schoolhouse has only a very small uh, small percentage of the factors that impact uh, a student's long-term goals and their academic achievement at that mm-hmm. so you know that what happens outside of, of schools having health care housing safety you know wage inequality wealth inequality racism those are the those are the major issues that impact a student's academic achievement so let's Mm-hmm. helps you know students and their families have the skills and the abilities to make changes mm-hmm. in those areas so that's Great. what got me you know and that's what that's what got me teaching also i was i was particularly interested in i had been working in immigrant communities for most of those organizing years yeah and uh, i was interested in continuing that work with immigrant communities my father was an immigrant from Italy, uh, right. grew up as sort of an immigrant household. He, interestingly enough, he taught English to new immigrants at night. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. So I never, didn't really think I'd ever follow in his footsteps, but uh, you never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be some influence there right. then, uh, for what you ended up doing. Yeah. So, but I mean, that, but that's what ended up happening. And as I mentioned, my first year, it was, you know, quite challenging, but it was an experience of a lifetime. How often can a high school teacher get a class of students who'd never been in school before? Right. I mean, I mean, yeah. it's sort of a gift in many ways, a challenging gift, but a gift nevertheless. Of course, of course. And, and also Larry, um, I think there's something else I, I wanted to just ask you about whether it is something that um, is of particular concern and uh, and that is we do see quite a lot in the news about the um, the violence uh, in schools in the states. It does seem to be sort of particularly highlighted. Uh, and things like the security related to school shootings, etc. I, I just wondered um, if that was something that is exaggerated in the news, or is something that is of particular concern. It might not be in your particular uh, school district, well, but what do you think? What do you think about that? Well, certainly, we're very aware of you know school shootings and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I mean, the United States has obviously a totally ridiculous uh, situation with the amount of guns that are here and our gun laws. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, I, I do think that the, uh, I mean, it's not unusual for our school to have what's called lockdowns, where right. schools are, you know, we have to close the windows, clo- you know, lock the doors. Uh, sometimes move students. Is that front. because of alerts or um, people? Ge- generally, it is not because of something happening in the school, though actually this year we did have a fight that caused that. But generally it's because of uh, crime outside of the school walls, right? right. In the neighborhood where the police are, are pursuing a suspect or there has been some violence outside and they want to make sure that the, that, the perpetrator, if he gets into the school, is not uh, a danger to students. Of course. Uh, in many ways, I would say, but I mean, school shootings are a problem. Okay, first thing I say, they are a problem. I, I think that a bigger problem in, in a lot of ways, especially in our school's community, are um, is community violence. And to give you an mm. example, a mile away from our school several years ago, Stefan Clark, who was an African-American man, mm-hmm. uh, armed, I quote, unquote, with a cell phone, uh, right. was, you know, was killed by police. 
and mm -hmm. uh, which causes uh, cause a great deal of dis distress among uh, the people living in our community and the students in our in our school, rightfully so. Course. So uh, there is a problem of violence. There's a problem of police violence. There is a problem of violence in schools. Um, I mean, the United States has a violence violence problem and it has a gun problem, and we have too yeah. many guns, and uh, you know we have a, a Supreme Court that refuses to acknowledge that, even though they all the Supreme Court justices get they're very safely guarded and secure, but they, you know, and, and but they're happy mm -hmm. at creating situations that make it less safe for the rest of us. So. Uh, but I, but, but I think it is school shootings are, are, un, are not common, right? I mean, they happen, mm -hmm. they, they happen, don't, they don't happen infrequently. Most schools are a very safe place. Uh, I still remember though, after, after the Safan Clark shooting, yeah, I, you know, I talked to students and said, you know, that we will um, do everything possible to keep you safe in our school. Uh, we want, you know, we want this to be a safe environment. And the students said, but Mr. Falazzo, what happens when I go home? Right. I know, mm -hmm. you know what happened, you know, and, and that's right. I mean, it's our students carry cell phones, right? Devon Clark had a cell phone. The police said, "Yeah, said it was a gun." Uh, so, you know, our students see George Floyd in themselves. They see they see themselves mm -hmm. in Stephon Clark. You know, especially our African American students. Uh, so we, you know, it's it's a you know it's a it's, it's a problem. It is indeed a problem, and arming teachers, which is what some what some conservative polit politicians want to happen, is not is not the way to go. No, I, I can't imagine that would be a, a good idea. <laughs> I, I can't it, imagine it, it, teachers voting for that either. No, I mean, it, it, no, no, and in the Nashville shooting, the most recent school shooting, the Nashville private school a couple of weeks ago. Teachers, there were teachers who were armed in that school, and it did oh, not really? help. Yeah, but it did, obviously didn't stop anything. So, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's the United States has a lot of wonderful opportunities and a lot mm -hmm. of wonderful gifts, and we've also got some huge challenges. So and uh, and violence and gun violence is, you know, is one of them. I mean, our daughter, who's actually now living in the Netherlands, she, you know, heard mm -hmm. from her friend there was a a murder just down the, you know, a few blocks from our house uh, uh, oh, wow. earlier, earlier this week, and she was really concerned, and she said, "Well, I want to make sure that we're locking our dog door at night." Right. I mean, it's, it's. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. The yeah, threat just, of someone actually getting in through the dog door. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, she was concerned about it, but I mean, we've got a big dog door and a big door. We're not really concerned about it, but I mean, it's, right. it's, uh, I mean, American culture there. I mean, it's, we've got a lot of challenges. So, uh, but we just keep on, you know, we fight the good fight to try to, bring sanity to American gun laws and uh, help our students to be equipped to organize for, for their families. And we just do our best. It's all we can do. Of course, of course. So Larry, I just want to thank you so much for talking uh, to me today. Um, one of the reasons why I love doing this is being able to reach out to people like yourself who I know uh, online, but we've never actually spoken together uh, despite the number of years that we've actually been connected. 
Um, and it's just so such a great experience to be able to 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 speak to you and hear um, about more about your teaching experience and about your experience within education in general. And uh, it's been great speaking to you. And uh, I didn't know half of the things that you were involved in, so mm-hmm. I've I've certainly learned quite a lot about what you're doing. And uh, I've got a lot of respect for the kind of teaching you do as well. And I imagine it's such a challenging thing. So uh, hats off to you. Well, it's great to connect with you. You know, as as I mentioned, we've had a mutual admiration society for quite a while. So uh, <laughs> uh, it is. I mean, it is good to always connect to someone uh in a different way than just uh uh, through words on the internet so oh uh, definitely i I mean and uh yeah so and uh well good luck with all of the the upcoming projects and the next seven weeks of school i'm sure you'll do very well and uh everything will work out thank you thank you and the and the same to you have a good rest of the day and a good summer okay thanks Thanks a lot larry thank you okay bye bye so um that brings us uh to near the end of the today's twilight show um i'm so happy and very thankful to today's special guest larry falato uh, for joining uh, joining me for that conversation. Uh, as I said there, just at the end, Larry and I have been sort of connected on the internet quite some time, and it's such a great uh, thing to be able to speak at length about uh, his experience uh, as a teacher, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, thank you also to everybody uh, who has joined us live. Now, remember to check out Larry's website if you want to know more about uh, his work and uh, his projects. I really recommend it. Uh, it's larryfalato.edublogs.org. Um, and I think you can subscribe to some of the things that he, he produces on a very regular basis. And so that's it from me. And there are Teacher Talk radio shows all week on all manner of interesting topics. So please listen in live or listen to the recordings. And I hope you will join me again next week at the same time. And bye for now. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. ASCOL is due to ballot members for the first time in its history. The four education unions will ballot over strike action this term and, if backed by members, would see action stretching into next year and could lead to full school closures. The government continues to hold its position that the most recent pay offer is fair and reasonable and that next year school funding will be at its highest level in history. Schools Week covers the further implications of school funding issues in a story about the cuts some head teachers are making. In a survey conducted by the National Foundation for Education Research for the Sutton Trust, it was found that schools are cutting back on school trips, teaching assistance and IT equipment to help balance stretch budgets. Responses from 1,428 primary and secondary teachers Sure, 50% of senior leaders said their school had cut back on trips and outings this year. Schools in the most disadvantaged areas were most likely to be impacted by cuts to trips. The research suggests that in secondary schools, leaders are also cutting back on subject choices at both GCSE and A level. The Department for Education has estimated schools overall could afford $2.4 billion in new spending between 2022 and 2024 before facing net pressure on their budgets. But the Confederation of School Trusts warned its members could face a prolonged period of financial challenge due to pay rises and other increasing costs if more funding was not forthcoming. The Sutton Trusts poll also showed that some school leaders are using pupil premium funding to plug budget gaps. The report also underlines the issue of recruitment into the sector, with the NFER predicting that the DfE will again miss its recruitment into initial teacher training target this year. Meanwhile, the TES focused on a DfE funding rule change to help schools hit by falling pupil numbers due to a decline in birth rate. 
schools that are not rated good or outstanding will be eligible for additional funding. Other changes will be introduced from 2024 to 25, and councils will set expectations around the minimum funding they must provide to support schools with significant increases in pupil numbers. Schools with more than one site will also receive extra funding where they need to duplicate services over multiple sites. Falling birth rates mean there are projected to be half a million fewer pupils in English state nurseries and primaries in 2028, compared with 2022. Nurseryworld.co.uk reports on the findings of its recent survey into staff wellbeing around Ofsted inspections. In the article on its website, it reports that over 3,000 owners, managers and staff responded to questions around mental health and well-being and the impact of inspections. Many responded that they felt increased stress and anxiety in the run-up to an inspection, with many having sleepless nights and some suffering from panic attacks and depression. The possibility of losing funding, should a setting be judged inadequate, was also mentioned. Full details of the survey can be found on the Nursery World website. The Guardian reports that a record figure of £4.8 billion interest has been added to student debt in Britain last year. The government has more than doubled the amount of money it makes from charging interest on student loans as graduates face borrowing costs of almost twice the rate set by the Bank of England. The Office for National Statistics said the accrued interest had doubled from £2.3 billion in the previous year. The forecast average debt among the cohort of students who started their course in 2021 and 22 is £45,800 when they complete their course. Finally, the Morning Star in Scotland reports that increased spending per school pupil is failing to deliver improved outcomes. Spending per pupil has risen to £8,500 in Scotland, compared with around £7,200 across England, Wales and Northern Ireland but attainment in Scotland is not on a similarly rising trajectory. Research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that despite having the highest spending per pupil across the UK for a long period, test scores in reading, maths and science have either stayed the same or have been going down. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to attempt to explain in simple terms how the internet works. Let's take this tech briefing for example. I know every single one of you at some point have thought, how on earth can someone who makes a recording in one part of the world be broadcast globally to thousands of people and there'd be very few errors? I won't even go off when you go under a bridge. Although, I did give Tom Rogers a lift once and can tell you he's so radio he stopped talking when I drove through the Mersey Tunnel. For the internet to work, a way of allowing people to simultaneously use the same cables had to be created. The traditional phone call method could not be used because this would limit the number of users. If computers made a dedicated connection like a phone call does, then there'd be a lot of waiting going on. Imagine if you had to wait in line for a download. You are 457th in the queue. Your download is important to us. Please listen to this monotonous music while you wait. It simply wouldn't catch on. So, what happens? Data is transmitted in a similar way to the postal system. Just a lot quicker. Right now, this podcast is arriving on your device in a series of packets. Packets are really small chunks of data that can be sent from device to device via routers. Without getting too geeky on you, the server gets a request from you and you press play. The request says, start sending me the packets of the audio chocolate you know as Steve Woods' tech briefing. And like chocolate, it's split into chunks. These chunks are given an address to get to, an address of where they came from, some other information like the type of file being sent, so your device knows which application to open it in, and a number so the packets can be ordered and rebuilt when they arrive. These packets are directed over the internet by routers that use the address information to direct them and then rebuilt by your device once they arrive. Because packets are so small and can be forwarded rapidly, lots of computers can send data at the same time and keep everybody connected. So next time you're using the internet, consider that what you are looking at has probably been split into thousands of packets routed across the world and being rebuilt in a matter of milliseconds for you to enjoy. As always, if you have a tech question, why not send it to at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods. And that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time. 
on Teachers Talk Radio.